Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson one of the Hello World series of my MSMB programming tutorials. Today we're going to be looking at Risk OS, and we're going to learn how to get a simple Hello World message onto the screen. We're then going to create a single ASM file. We're going to learn how to use VASM to compile it, make it into a file that our emulators can run, and we'll learn how to get that file onto the emulator and get the emulator to start up and run that file. So we're really going to see the start to the end of getting the Hello World running, and this should be great if you're just getting unstarted, especially if you don't want to use the build scripts that I've created and you want to do something yourself because you'll see each stage that I've used and you can replace the bits you don't want to use with your own alternatives if you want to use a different assembler or a different emulator that's of course all absolutely great so we're going to see the basic example that just shows hello world and then we'll see a more advanced version which also includes a, a few simple monitor tools that I've created one that dumps all the registers to the screen and one that dumps an area of memory to the screen and these will help you out if you're getting started and you want to play with things and see some results or if you're having trouble and you need to know what was going going wrong if one of your registers are getting corrupted, things like that. So just some stuff that's an easy addition to that Hello World example. Let's go over to the source code, let's see it in action, and then let's learn how it works. So if I just start my emulator up here, okay, you can see here we have a Hello World message there, right at the top there. You can see it's running within the um, console window here. And then if I press a key, we'll actually jump back to the operating system. And I can actually restart it here. It's been saved as this prog file here. But I've actually got a startup script, which was starting it automatically just to save a little bit of time. So there we go. So that's what we're going to be creating in the first case. And we'll be seeing how we do that in just a moment. OK. So here is the assembly file. You can, of course, get this from my website, as always. And we're going to go through each section of it and explain how it works on this system. Now, the program needs to start at memory address 8000 in hexadecimal. So we've got an org statement here to do that. And we actually need to set up our own stack space on this system. So we've got a, an area defined as stack here. And we're loading that into the stack pointer. And you can see that stack is actually here. And we've defined an area of 128 bytes here for that stack. And basically what we're doing here is we're jumping over that area with this jump command here. So we're skipping over the stack area here so that we've got this spare memory for our stack to use up. And then what we're doing here is we're using a print string routine here, which will print the characters to the screen. The message is the hello world here. And in my tutorials, I have a very specific way of doing things that I'm sure loads of people won't like, and I'm sure I don't really care if they don't like. Um, I actually use character 255 terminated strings. And what I do is I use a print char routine of if necessary of the firmware if there is one but I actually use a print string routine that I've written myself and the reason for this is consistency all of my systems use 255 termination uh, this helps me for pointing um, games between different systems within the same CPU and even different CPUs so that's why I do it that way and I know some people will prefer other ways I understand that but that's not the way I do things in these tutorials so that's what we've got here okay so how are we actually doing things well Generally, I don't like using the firmware and the operating system calls, but for this super simple example here, it's appropriate to do so. So that's what we're doing. We're using these software interrupts, SWI. The SWI0 is the write character routine here, and this will write the character in R0 to the screen. And so that's what our print char routine is doing. Our print string routine is just repeatedly using that print char routine, reading in a, um, a character at a time from the address in R1 here, checking if they're 255, and if they are, we're just returning. If they're not, we're passing them all to that print char. So that's how our print string routine is building on that print char. Now, if there would be a case where we need to do a new line, there is actually a special software interrupt for that as well, SWI03 in hexadecimal. That is the OS new line function, and that is starting a new line, and we need that for our uh, monitor later on. The final SWI we're using is the return to operating system, hexadecimal 11 here that will return to the operating system. And an error code is passed in R0. So we're loading that with a zero, which marks no error. So it just returns to the operating system as normal, which is um, what we're doing in this case. So there we go. So that's basically everything here. You can see we've got a, the um, string here and an address of the string here so that we can load that address in there. And we're just showing it to the screen twice just so we can test that new line function. OK, so how do we actually compile this? Well, in my tutorials, if I press F6 on my keyboard here, I get this menu here. And this lets me select one of the different systems I'm compiling to. Some of my examples are multi-platform cross-compilable, so that they will compile to different systems. 
This super simple one won't, but um, the theory still stands. And so I've got this RISC-OS batch file that does my compilation. Now, a lot of the code in here is actually surplus. It's testing and checking and allows me to do things like um, set different paths and things. The really important part that you want to look at here is this line here. This is the compilation routine. Now, I'm using VASM, the ARM assembler here. I'm using the STD format. That's the standard format here. And that, that affects the syntax of some of the things. So that's the one I'm using. And we've got a lot of different um, parameters here and I'm gonna go through them all and explain what they do and which ones you need and which ones you don't need and which ones you might want to keep. Okay, so the first thing is the source file. This percent build file percent is being specified by my script here, but that would be your hello.asm or something like that, your source file that you're compiling. We need to specify a destination format fbin tells it to output a binary file this is a raw file that the, uh, it will hopefully have some kind of header and give give whatever our emulator needs and um, in this case we don't really need much of anything so it's going to be okay so um, what we're then doing is we're specifying the output file name and we're calling it prog comma ff8 ff8 is the file format but it doesn't use a, a full stop it uses a comma so don't don't mistake that if you're looking at this on a small screen it's prog comma ff8 which is the executable file for this system okay now we're specifying to compile for arm2 here that's the um, arm syntax we're using here we're specifying some optimization options and these basically allow the assembler to help us out if we specify a very long um, variable value that won't fit in a single command the assembler will break it up and make lots of add commands to compensate for that so this is just making our lives a little bit easier with the arm um, instruction set there check labels we'll check that we've not put any um, command if we put a command with no tabs then it will be mistaken for a label. So this will check that if one of our labels looks suspiciously like a command, it'll warn us we've probably made a mistake there and we need to fix it. No case disables case sensitivity. That just helps me out a lot because I, I'm a bit sloppy being a Windows user. I don't tend to be very consistent with my case a lot of the time. Now, the next important one we've got is this L here. This outputs a listing file. Now, listing files are very handy. What they are is a, the contents of our file that we compiled, like this um, command here, and the resulting bytes that it compiled to. And this is very handy when things get weird and don't work the way we expect. They're also quite handy if you're um, wanting to really learn how the actual software works, because you can see things like when we've specified a command, um, sometimes it will have compiled into multiple commands and we might not have realized that that was happening. I can't actually see any here, but sometimes when we we're um, specifying a command like loading a value in it actually has to be broken into multiple commands be because of that optimization that I mentioned before it seems like the code here though is also simple it's not necessary a bad example but anyway as I say that that is definitely the case now the final thing I'm doing is I'm def defining some symbols on the command line here this D command is defining a symbol called VASM uh, one called CPU arm 2 and one called build ROS. Now you don't need these for the example you just saw. These are for my multi-platform code which as I say will compile to different systems and the way it does it is different sections will turn on and off depending on if you're compiling for a Game Boy Advance or RISC OS. So these are all related to that. The VASM one is in case I decide to change assemblers later which I did with the Z80 series. CPU arm 2 is to disable some of the functionality that is, ne is available on the, um, on the Nintendo DS and the Game Boy Advance that aren't available on the ARM2 that the RISC OS tends to favor. So as I say, those aren't needed for the basic example, but they're certainly worth having. Now, what I'm doing then is I'm copying this file into the hostfs folder, the host file system folder of RISC OS. Now, what this does is it puts it into a position where the emulator is going to be able to run it. If I just go to my RISC OS RPC emulation folder here. If I just turn on my zoom here. Now you've got this um, host FS folder here. If we go into here, you can see we've got this prog.ff8 and this is the one that we've just created. So we compile it and we then copy it to this folder. Now to start the emulator, what we're doing here is we're using this RPC emu here. Now this is automatically starting up and it's immediately running that command. Now the way I've got this to work is um, basically if we just close that down, if you go into this um, hostfs folder and into this boot folder, you'll see there's this file called run.feb and this is a script that the system is running on startup. You can see basically um, we've got desktop prog at the end of this and this is telling it to load the program Onto the, into the desktop application. So that's showing that starting thing. Now, 
rather curiously, I downloaded the latest version and I couldn't get this script to run, which means one or two things. Either the emulator's changed very slightly or I've forgotten how I got it working originally. Now, either is completely possible. I can't find any, I, I did try and find any files that had changed for see if there was a configuration file. I was using the same ROM file, but I can't remember. It was many years, it was a couple of years ago now I got this um, set up originally and I can't remember what I did exactly. It was a bit of took a bit of an effort. But anyway, you can download the pre-configured emulator from my website with one um, limitation. Due to licensing, I can't provide you with the ROM file. I'm using RiscOS 3.71 here. You would need to get that ROM yourself and put it into the ROMs folder because I cannot provide that. So um, that is a limitation. But as I say, you, you can download the script here. And even if you can't get that startup script working, as you saw earlier, it's very easy to just manually load up the file just as soon as the emulator starts. If I just skip past it here, all I need to do is go to hostfs and just run it from here. And you can see it runs just fine. It just takes a little bit of extra time, which when you're running it and making mistakes and things, you, you want to keep those um, <laughs> those reruns down to a minimum. So if you can get things automated, all the better. So anyway, this is the second example. And you can see now we've got a monitor. You can see we've got a dump of all the registers here. And we've also got a mem dump. You can see we've got a dump of some of the memory here. And that's the hello world message. So that's what we've dumped. And we'll have a look now and we'll see how we were able to do that. Now, basically, this file includes some extra lines here. We're including this monitor file here and we're defining the screen size here. Now, I'm not going to explain how this works because it's a painfully complex file and it really doesn't matter. It's just a little bonus for today's example. Basically, we can now use this monitor function and that will show the contents of the registers to the screen. That's all of these things up here. The second thing we've got is this mem dump. We can specify a label and we can specify a number of lines here and we can just run the mem dump and that will dump the memory to the screen. And these are fantastic if you're just getting started and you want to test things. You're either you're testing like reading from a joystick and you want to see the results of the screen or you're testing reading and writing with the registers and the different addressing modes and you don't want to see those results in memory. And um, these should help you out with that. And they certainly helped me out when I was learning. So they were a little bonus that I always make with these Hello World examples because basically the works already done there and um, I want to give you enough to get started if you decide you don't want to use the more complex tutorials and the more complex scripts that I've done in the past because I know I know a lot of you will want to do things from scratch and so I try and give you the bare minimum so you can take things your own direction which if you're able to do so is absolutely the way you should probably do things anyway that's all we're going to be covering today. I hope you've enjoyed this, hope you found it interesting. We're gonna be doing Hello World on the Nintendo DS and the Game Boy Advance later. So if you've liked what you've seen today and you wanna see more ARM, please hit the subscribe button so you see those as well. And there'll be more Risk OS coming at some point in the future, I'm sure. Anyway, if you could hit the like button on this video because YouTube recommends on likes, that would really help me out because um, I need as many viewers as I can get. And if people like them, maybe I'll, we'll get a few more. Maybe those other people will like the videos as well. Anyway, go to my website. You can download the build scripts. You can download the um, source file for today. You just can't download that ROM file because I can't distribute it, but you can get the rest. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for watching today. If you've enjoyed this video today, please consider supporting my content. It takes 20 to 30 hours a week to keep making these videos. It's basically all I do when I'm not doing my day job. And it's only through the support of my patrons and the other sponsors that I'm able to continue justify doing it, essentially. You can back me on Patreon. I post a weekly update with the latest work on the current projects I'm doing. You can see one here and also the newest videos. There's a large backlog of videos that are currently only available to the patrons, although they will all be available to everyone later on. And also it's the backers who I ask when it comes to making decisions on how to change the content in the future, what new content to create and things like that. You can see there was a recently a survey of the backers so I can plan next year's content. As well as Patreon, you can now become a member of my channel on YouTube. There's a join button you should see just below this video. You can use that. YouTube backers get the same content as Patreon. I just post it through the YouTube interface instead of the Patreon. It's the same content every week. Also, if you prefer, you can go to my Teespring store and you can get some Chibi Akamas merchandise or some Learn ASM merchandise if you prefer, if that's how you would like to back me. Links for all three are in the description of this video below. Uh, anyway, whatever you decide to do, I hope you've really enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.